Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to have you back at our MDI Science Cafes. We are very excited to have Rich McDonald with us this evening and I look forward to telling you a little bit more about um, his work and what we're going to hear about this evening. Before we do that, I want to just say a couple of quick words of introduction and just run through a few housekeeping details, as you all know well by now. Um, we're asked that you'll stay muted during the majority of our presentation. We will open it up for questions and answers um, toward the end of, of Rich's PowerPoint. And at that time, if you'd like to use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen, we'd be more than happy to have you ask your question in person. Otherwise, we would love for you to type that into the chat and we'll be monitoring that and I'd be happy to ask on your behalf. So with that, we'll get that out of the way. And then just a quick reminder of our science cafes um, and the purpose, you know, as you know, these are really designed to engage the community uh, in, in a broad conversation around science and really creating a forum where we can have conversations about a variety of topics. Um, and I think now, probably more than ever, especially having gone through the last 19 months with uh, COVID-19 and in a pandemic, we recognize that science really impacts our daily lives in many, many different ways. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about our interactions with the natural world. And as, as many of you know, um, climate change is an issue that is very much on our minds and to sort of help us think about some of the small, perhaps more enjoyable ways or steps that we can take as individuals to reduce our carbon footprint. We thought it would be fun to have a conversation with field biologist Rich McDonald this evening. And as many of you I'm sure know, uh, Rich is a world-class naturalist. He, he travels all over. He has got, he's uh, led people on tours as far away as Antarctica and Norway. And he is the co-owner with Natalie Springle of the Natural History Center, which they founded together in 2010. And their mission is to share their passion for ecology and the people of this region. So Rich is a lifelong birder. He is a guide, a naturalist, a field biologist, and a writer. And so drawing on his training and his early career as an ornithologist, he now leads um, nature tours, nature and adventure tours. And those tours incorporate science, culture, and natural history. So I'm sure you've probably seen him out and about with his binoculars, uh, enjoying this beautiful, beautiful area in which we're all fortunate to live. Recently, Rich has written a book uh, called Little Big Ear, Chasing Acadia's Birds. And it was actually through that process that as he was chronicling his adventures that he began to think about carbon footprint when birding. It, it sounds as though he put on almost 6,500 miles on his car as he was uh, you know, riding around MDI and, and surrounding areas to follow these birds. And so, that has led him to take on yet another project, a writing project, where he's going to talk about zero carbon birding. And so with, with that sort of overview, I want to uh, turn things over to Rich. And, and hopefully, Rich, during our conversation, we'll have an opportunity to kind of you know, marry some of MDIBL's interests with your interests. I think we know that raising awareness of environmental impact and the connection of the environment to our own health is, is certainly something that we um, are, are very committed to here at MDIBL. You know, we've also recently participated in this project uh, called Landscape of Change with the MDI Historic Society. And it strikes me that there may be a lot of overlap there in terms of some of your interests and certainly your work to catalog um, all of your, you know, of your bird birding adventures. And so maybe we can touch on some of that as well. But I want to turn it over to you now and just welcome you to the MDIBL Science Cafe stage. And we look forward to hearing your presentation. Great. Well, thank you, Jerry. I'm really excited to be, be the science, to do the Science Cafe tonight. Mm -hmm. And um, before I start talking, I wanted to share an anecdote with everybody. I shared with Jerry before you guys all came on. Um, I moved here in the fall of 2002. And um, I, when I lived in the Adirondack Mountains, I was doing various research, including on cormorants, the double-crested cormorant. And there was one article that I'd been looking for, and I couldn't get through interlibrary loan, and, and it never occurred to me to write to the biolab where the article was published long ago. I forget what, I should dig up the article. I think it was back in the 30s or 40s it was published. Um, 
And so anyway, so I was in town. I said, oh, there's a bio lab right down the road. I'll just, I'll stop in one day and see if somebody will, if you've got it somewhere, I can go check it out. And when I first got out, graduated university in 86, I was working in Lake Placid at the W. Alton Jones Cell Science Center. And it was run by a gentleman, uh, Dr. Gordon Sato. And his son was a senior scientist there, Denry. And Denry really took me under his wing. Here's this young, bright-eyed kid, kind of shy kid out of college, didn't know anybody or anything in Lake Placid. And Denry, was, he was a great, a great mentor to have for that summer. So here I am now at the bio lab. It's, it's you know, 15, almost 20 years later. And, um, and I'm, as somebody directed me to where all the, the old articles were, all the old journals, and I'm looking through the stacks. And there was a, right around the corner was a dining room for the bio lab staff. And I heard this laugh that was very distinctive. There's only one person in the world that has this laugh, and that was Denry. I hadn't seen him in many years, easily a decade. So I poked my head around the corner, and Denry saw me in his very dry way. said, oh, hello, Rich. Almost like I, it was like yesterday that he'd seen me. So it was great. So that was my introduction to the bio lab. That's terrific. Well, I should tell you now, Rich, that all of our bulletins, so from 1914 uh, all the way through present day, have now been digitized. So oh, good. Daniel Lake and you could look for all those articles. I wouldn't hear Denry laughing. So it's, That's know, right. <laughs> and I, I have to say, just as an aside, and I'll dive into my presentation, one of my favorite uh, cold rainy day or cold winter day activities to do is to go sit in the archive stacks in some university library somewhere and look through old ornithological journals for articles that that increasingly are online but it's not the same as having it in your hands that's true um well great well let me dive into this so uh, yeah um and when you were introducing me jerry i was thinking like god that guy sounds really interesting i want to meet him but, <laughs> and and i'm like it's just my life it's my normal but, you know we all have our own normal and it's and my normal is not necessarily everybody else's normal, but it's, for me, it's normal. So I'm like, I'm not that great, but I'm glad you guys think so. So, um, so anyway, I started getting interested in nature when I was a little kid. And I, I don't even know quite when it began. Um, I'm teaching a class at College of the Atlantic and this fall, and we're using as our, one of our breedings, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Breeding Sweetgrass. And she talks about animacy and kind of your relationship with animals and plants. And and their relationship with you. I always thought it was a one-way thing, me to them, but there's a, it's a two-way relationship. And I really like that kind of traditional Native American approach. And, and then it got me thinking, okay, so where did my relationship with the natural world begin? And I have some of my earliest memories are being this little kid. I don't know how old I was. I was four, maybe three. I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but I remember going in, our, in rural Western New York, going in our yard and walking up to this big old maple tree and talking to the tree. I have no idea what I said. I don't know if it talked back to me, but my mother, I, I called her this morning to say, do you remember me doing that? It's like, oh yeah, you talk to the trees all the time. And, and I said, did they talk back? She's like, I don't know, you were too far away. I couldn't hear what you're saying, but, but like, so there was some relationship that started at a young age. That I, I had this relationship with nature and it certainly grew. I, you know, I used to love hiking up the Niagara River Gorge from some, again, some of my earlier memories, memories hiking up the gorge. When I was about 10 years old, um, I remember very clearly the day that this gentleman, Jerry Farrell, knocked on the door of our house and asked for my father. I was a little kid. I'm like, I'm going to answer the door. It's like somebody here. And so I, he knocked on the door and answered the door. And there's this guy in a uniform and says, hello, may I speak to your father, please? And so I go get my father and he comes and says, you know, hello, my name is Jerry Farrell. I'm a biologist and I'm studying birds, especially ducks, as they migrate. Um, and where your house is situated on the Niagara River, it's a really good place for them to stop during migration. Would you mind if I stop traps during fall migration to study them. And my father said, that'd be fine on one condition, that if any of my boys want to help, they can. So I'm the oldest, I was about 10. Next brother, Rob, was about eight. And today, Rob's a wildlife biologist in Alaska. And so both of us like, yeah, yeah, we want to do it. And, and it became a thing we did every spring and every fall migration right through high school. And, and, you know, and when that started for me, that was this critical age. It was this age of like eight to 11 or 12, somewhere in that kind of rough range where exposing the kids to different stimuli can, can potentially have a huge impact. Teddy Roosevelt, um, when, he was, when he was about that age range, he was introduced to birds and birding. And he actually wrote the, the first bird book for the Adirondacks. At, uh, he was 14 years old when it was published. Um, oh, wow. And there's a lot of other similar stories of people that, that went on to become really noted naturalists, ornithologists, whatever their profession was, that got their start at that, that critical age. So for me, it was putting a wild duck in my hands at 10 years old. Mm. And there's so many life lessons I could tell you and, um, about it, and I'll, I'll touch on one or two of them during our, our talk, but, but really, 
it was just amazing to me. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of set the course of my life. I also didn't have the clarity of vision to say, okay, now I'm going to become an ornithologist. I'm going to go straight line and get there. I didn't do that. I zigzagged all over the place. You know, I've worked in labs. I've worked in the field. I've led tours and, and I've done computer consulting, but it's always the unifying theme, except for the computer consulting was, uh, was nature. And where my brother Rob from that time on, he said, I'm going to grow up. I'm going to be a wildlife biologist in Alaska. And he never varied. And he went straight line. And he got there. So <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, but so, the, so the birds were really, you know, kind of my intro, introduction to the natural, or maybe the next introducing me to the next level of the natural world. Um, you know, after, after I graduated college, um, and after that one summer position at the W. Alton Jones Cell Science Center, I got a job on top of Whiteface Mountain studying acid rain. I actually had been playing ultimate frisbee with those guys all summer, and they said, all of our students are back to college. We need, we need a, somebody to work for a month. Do you want a month? I'm 21 or 22, you know, yes, I'll get another month's science experience in my resume. Sure, I'll do it. And a month turned into two months, then it turned into, you know, through the winter, and then it was, then it was through the next summer, and then it was the next year. And it kept, suddenly 10 years later, I said, oh, I think I'm ready to move on to the next thing. And uh, it was just a great experience. And so um, at that point, I realized as I was doing the acid rain work, I said, um, I, I remember my mother asking me one time, like, what do you like about your work? And I said, well, it has purpose. And I started to get really focused on what I, what I did in my life. I wanted to have meaning. It didn't have to necessarily have grand scale international meaning, but it had to have a purpose that I deemed important. Um, and so to me, anything environmentally related is important. The work I did with banding ducks all through high school, uh, elementary and high school was important. Um, being involved in acid rain and then climate studies on Whiteface Mountain was really important. And I, I take great pride still in it just this, um, the passage of the Clean Air Act of 1990, my work played some little tiny part of that, but, but my work does, you know, if you go back and read some of the, the legislation, they talk about, you know, um, SO2 and NOx emissions, uh, so sulfur and, and nitrogen emissions, and, and a lot of that was based on my work on Whiteface Mountain. So oh, my name's not mentioned anywhere in there, but I'm like, I made a difference, a little tiny difference. So, so I, you know, I'm, I'm happy that, you know, President George H.W. Bush signed the Clean Air Act of 1990. Um, when I met Natalie, my wife, now my wife, and I lived in Lake Placid, New York area, and she lived here, and we did the long distance dating thing for a couple of years. But we, uh, from early on in the relationship, she told me about her dream of doing this, this big five month long, 1500 mile kayak expedition around the Gulf of Maine. And I, I remember asking her one time early on, so, well, how come you haven't done it yet? And she said, well, because I haven't found anybody to do it with. And so I think it was, as I recall it, she might tell a different story, but as I recall it, it was our second date. And she said, and I said, well, I'll do it with you. Now imagine, you know, somebody you've just met, they're going to commit to doing a five month adventure with you. She's like, I can imagine her thinking, yeah, right. But we planned it, took two years planning it and we did it. And, and that had purpose too. Our purpose was to raise awareness about issues facing coastal communities and to raise awareness about the phenology or the timing of events in the natural world as we were paddling. So it was really cool. And you know, again, I did something that really was filled with purpose. And then yeah. And then bring it to the present and, and kind of Jerry's introduction. Um, in 2018, it was a big year in the world of birds and ornithology. It was the 100th anniversary of the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is uh, one of the earlier pieces of environmental legislation in our country. And it was certainly, to this day, it's one of the more significant pieces of environmental legislation. And so National Geographic Magazine declared it the year of the bird because of the 100th anniversary. And, and so I'm thinking, okay, so it's going to be the, and I'm, this is the end of 2017, I'm thinking this, it's going to be the 100th anniversary, and National Geographic's declared it the, the, uh, the you know, year of the bird, and here in Maine, it was the start of the Maine Breeding Bird Atlas, which is a, uh, still ongoing, it's a five-year effort to document the breeding distribution of birds all across the state of Maine, and so I'm the, one of the regional coordinators for this area, and, and so um, I'm thinking, like, 2018 is going to be a big year. Again, I want to do something with purpose. How can I honor and celebrate all these things? And you know, what, what is that? And so some of you might know, and actually maybe this is a good point for me to pause for a minute, share my screen and put on a, put on, um, a PowerPoint I've got with some pictures. You don't have to look at me and the screen of names. Oops, not chat. I'm going to hit share. And there's share my screen. And then fill the screen. There we go. So I'm gonna, 
I think I'm going to zoom ahead. There we go. I uh, should put this as the first slide. Um, so, so some of you might know this movie, The Big Year. Um, it was based on a, on a nonfiction book by Steve Obamasic. And the movie is fiction. In fact, the movie is really funny when it starts. It's, you know, sometimes movies have those opening credits where they tell you something, uh, you know, movies based on a real events or real inspired by real story. This one says something to the effect of, this movie is inspired by real events. Only the facts have been changed. So you know right off the bat, between that and these three characters here, it's going to be a good comedy. Um, but this is what brought birding to the big screen. And, and so a big year is basically a year effort to see how many birds you can see. And the kind of the most famous big years are when they're done continent wide, uh, North American wide. And, and I wanted to do something, but the amount of cost for money, for time, and for carbon to do a big year continent wide was way beyond anything I was comfortable with. It certainly didn't fit my family budget. I'm running a nature tour business. I don't have the time. And oh my gosh, think about all the cost of, you know, these guys, the, the guys that actually did it, they were spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in plane fare alone for that year of birding and flying countless, countless trips back and forth across the continent. So I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something more local. And I've always been local in my approach, whatever I've done. And local can be, you know, kind of in the eye of the beholder. Um, to Natalie, when she first came up, the idea of the Gulf of Maine expedition, the Gulf of Maine was local. That was her backyard. And granted, it's a big backyard, but that was her backyard. So I decided, what is local for me? It's Hancock County. And that seemed like a good local. I've, I've done big years just for fun where it was just MDI. And those seemed kind of easy. It's not a very big geography. It's a great geography. I love it. And I love when I can go months and, not, and say that I've not left MDI. But I wanted to push my comfort zone a little bit and push me up into northern Hancock County. So, so I did that. I'm going to zip back to the wrong way. Sorry. Go back to the first slide. One more. So I took some inspiration from these guys. And these are guys, some of you may have heard of the Champlain Society. Um, these guys were uh, most, I think, if not entirely, certainly mostly Harvard students um, in the early 1880s. And they would come up and they'd camp out um, in the he head of Somme Sound area. And, and they, there was an ichthyologist and an ornithologist and a geologist and a botanist. And, and they're all students trying to document the natural world. And it was a combination of, you know, boys retreat and drink, drink whatever they're drinking, you know, scotch or whatever, smoke cigars and, and be off on their own. But they were doing some real serious observations. This was an era when, when science, field science meant observational science. There wasn't a lot of, of what they were doing that has changed. Back then it was like, go out and document, is that a Cape May warbler? Is it actually nesting? Oh my gosh, they've never nested in the continental US before. Like that was the kind of thing that they were looking for. Um, and that was big, big science, field observations. We don't, there was so much we didn't know about the natural world because we needed, we needed scholarly observations using scientific method. Um, and now that's changed a lot. I still like that old school science. I keep thinking someday I'm going to go, be in, I'll be in a, uh, at some antique clothing store. I'm going to find a three-piece tweed suit that fits me. And, and I'm going to be like a Ludlow Grish, uh, Grisham type, Grisham type guy, wear my three-piece suit when I'm teaching or when I'm out in the field botanizing or, or ornithologically uh, doing orthology. Um, but I, I like the old school. I like taking observations. And in fact, you know, here's my little field notebook. It's always with me. I've got bankers boxes full of field notebooks of field observations. And that's what these guys did. They kept their notebooks, their journals and, and documented. And it would be really fun someday to take their journals and maybe somebody's done this. Um, or if not, maybe one of you will want to do this. I certainly dream of doing it someday, of taking their journals and go and look at the same place they looked and, and seeing what are they finding then? What are they finding today? Uh, what are we finding today? Is, is it different? How's it different? There are certainly aspects that have been done, like the breeding bird atlas, we'll get to some of that, but not necessarily by going to the same place and looking at this, maybe the same trees, but saying, okay, in the same geography we're looking. So I want to bring it, bring it in finer and finer to the way these guys did. Um, there's some things I can't do the same. They had their smooth bore collection guns and go out and shoot whatever they were seeing that was living so they could collect it and send it to, to the archives to, in, in Harvard. Um, so we don't do that anymore. We're trying to, you know, especially living things, uh, well, play, uh, animals, we're trying not to shoot too much to collect. But we have really good optics. They didn't have great optics back then. So we have good optics and, you know, good cameras. We can, we can 
document things that way. So these guys were certainly an inspiration, and I and I am I, I like their old style of prose. I like their idea of journal taking. My journals are not necessarily quite so intriguing to read. My journals are you know a mix of of notes and, and a lot of tabulations of what I'm seeing. But there's certainly value in what I'm doing too. I, you know, I've got date, I've got time, I've got location, I've got weather, and I've got counts. I've got lots and lots of counts of things. Um, and there's big value in that. Um, at some point, I'll talk about eBird, and eBird's a great way to make this information much more valuable. Let's see. So Jerry mentioned my book. So I, you know, I did this little big year, and I wrote a book about it. And um, let's see. So the, the, the book is probably what brought me up to the radar of the bio lab. Like, oh, I mean, I definitely have, you know, you live in a small area like this, you know, we all know people that work at the bio lab. We all know people that work at Jack's or at any of the number of tourist shops or restaurants. I, I love going out to, to various restaurants and know that might like, it's not some random person serving me. It's somebody I know. And so I, you know, I like, you know, when I go to a, a dinner party and, and I'll be talking to any number of people like, Oh, you work at the bio lab. What's what the cool thing you're doing today. So it's, you know, a small community. And so, you know, I'm, I, and, and Emily, who's uh, one of the Emily Burke, one of the bio lab staff, her children during the pandemic, we're doing online programming with me. James is, is he maybe 11 now, and Genevieve's a little bit younger. And you know, the the natural history and bird bug has bit them, and so um, so I've been doing a lot with them. So certainly, the, I was on the radar of the guys, the, the folks at the bio lab, and and the book didn't it didn't hurt that I wrote a book too to to help further make a connection. So so I wrote the wrote the book, and it's, the book is not a picture book. It's not a field guide. In fact, the only picture is the picture on the cover of the snowy owl that was that I shot up, the, shot the photograph of up on Sargent Mountain. I talked about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. That was my the, the beginning of my thinking about this big year. And just to quick review, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the, the basically what it says is that you cannot collect, hold, possess, or harm any species that is a migratory bird. Um, that means like legally we can't have bird nests that we find. We can't have bird feathers unless it's a few ex one of the few exceptions. House sparrow, European starling, rock pigeon, those are non-native invasive species that were introduced. And the story of how, why and how they were introduced is interesting in itself, but maybe we'll save that for another time. Um, game birds that you can hunt, that you can get a hunting license for, you're allowed to possess their parts, their feathers. Um, certainly not allowed to own eagle feathers um, unless you have a license. And so I have, by my connection with the College of Atlantic, I have a license to collect things in and then to take them to the, um, the tab in their archive at the College of the Atlantic. We talked about the movie. So I'm assuming that most, if not all of our, our listeners here know about, you know, know the region. Probably most of you are here or been here. Uh, but just a quick review, Hancock County on the left, there it is where it's in Maine. And then here it is a little bit more blown up. So it's a big county. And you know, it's 85 miles from the northernmost corner to Mount Desert Rock, and it's nearly 45 miles wide from Bucksport to, um, you know, over to uh, west of, I'm sorry, east of Gouldsboro. And it's got this great diverse bit of habitat. And um, when I do nature tours, and today's a great example. So I had, you know, mother, uh, an older mother and her adult son wanted a, a nature tour. They wanted something that was really easy, minimal walking, but so we went to Wild Gardens Acadia. And we saw lots of different habitats. And so I, I like talking about habitat. And so here we are, northern Hancock County. You know, look at this, this, um, this stream flowing through here. And where it's flowing, and you know, my mouse is kind of showing the greener area either side of the stream, that's a fen. A fen is essentially a bog with a river flowing through it or a stream flowing through it. Go over to the left where it's more red, that's, that's a bog. Bog does not have water flowing through it. The only input is atmospheric, so rain or snow and snow melt. Uh, you know, we've got intact or relatively intact forests. We've got, you know, this looks to be a fairly boreal forest, uh, conifers of all various sorts. We've got mountains. So this is a great northern forest habitat. And then you come south, you got Mount Desert Rock, 25 miles offshore. Um, I've had students that were out there all summer, and it was killing me. I, I haven't been out there yet this summer. And all summer long, they were emailing me their sightings, and they had so many amazing birds out there. Um, birds I have not seen this year. I'm like, oh, I, I want to see them. And, and you'll know why in a little bit. Um, you know, we've got this wonderful rocky shoreline. Birds like purple sandpipers starting to arrive now and will spend the winter here and leave here by 
end of May, early June of next year, you know, they like these rocky shorelines or just off the rocky shoreline. We look for common eider. You know, we've got urban areas like, and some of our listeners will think about, you know, if you think about the birds that are in your neighborhood today and whether your neighborhood's in town, you know, instead of birds, if you're not in town, if you're a little more rural like me, I live up in Town Hill, north of Bar Harbor, and we've got some forest around us. So a different set of birds where I live than in town. But 20 years ago when I moved to town and I would go birding in town, I never, ever, ever saw a cardinal. And then I don't know when, but at some point I started to see like, there's a cardinal in town. There's another. And now I go in town and there's, I can't go anywhere in town and not at least hear cardinals, let alone see cardinals. Um, that those species have shifted north considerably. There is some debate in the scientific community as why they've shifted north. Um, I shouldn't say shifted. They didn't shift the range. They've expanded the range. And so um, there's kind of two schools. Of, it's either climate change that, that um, gave them milder climates to shift north, or the theory that I kind of lean toward is that bird feeding has become really popular over the last 40 years. And so cardinals do really well at a bird feeder all winter long. And so we basically made a bird feeder pathway from kind of mid-Atlantic um, and even, even like New York City and Lower Hudson River Valley and a lot of Massachusetts, we've made a, a bird feeder pathway to encourage them to, to expand the range. And I remember it was about three years ago, the first cardinal showed up at my feeder here in Town Hill. And now I hear them every single day in my yard. And it's just so cool to see you know, middle of winter, there's snow on the ground, and there's a splash of red. Um, so eBird is, uh, you know, I talked about Champlain Society briefly and my style of note taking uh, with my field notebooks. And, and today with technology, technology is, you know, it's kind of, it's the, the blessing and the bane of our existence. And, and eBird is both simultaneously. It's the blessing because it's taken all these, it's enabled us to take all these, these multiple notebooks and, and our field observation at any given time and enter it into a database that's usable by scientists, it's usable by the general public. And when you're doing bird research, probably the single biggest limitation of doing research at any species that isn't a species we hunt or isn't an endangered species is getting population level data. And eBird has enabled us so we can get population level data. Um, you know, I was out this morning walking in my backyard and I saw an oven bird. This is a really unusual time of year to see an oven bird in my backyard. They're migrating. Uh, and this guy was singing, so I did my eBird report and mentioned oven bird and mentioned I was singing. Um, and so someday somebody's going to be studying oven birds and they're going to look at it and they're going to be looking through and, and they're going to see that I have a comment on my oven bird report. And they're going to say, singing in September? That's really unusual. Um, so, you know, things like that give it really, give it, give it value, but just the numbers give value too. Um, and when eBird was created, and I had the, the good fortune, or the honor even, of being part of the team that initially um, field tested it back in the late 90s, and early 2000s. And, and uh, it was originally just a US-based, uh, computer-based program. Computer, we didn't have smartphones yet. And, and uh, I remember at one point I was asked my opinion on, on how, how the utility of it. And I said, oh, this is gonna go nowhere. Nobody wanna, wants to go in the field, bird, write their notes down, go home, and then enter their data into the computer. But then, the, and it was kind of true, it didn't really take off. Then smartphones came to be, and now it's an app. I'm in the field, I don't have to use my notebook. I still force myself to, but I don't have to. I can enter all my data in the smartphone in the field instantaneously. And we're, we've seen an explosion in data, and now it's gonna become global too. So when I go to Antarctica, I'm reporting, I'm sometimes going to islands that maybe nobody's ever gone birdings. And then, not islands that people have never been to. People have always been to where I'm, go, I'm going certainly not birders in every one of these islands. So I'm reporting islands. And I remember you know, I was the first one to document one particular colony of wandering albatross. That was so cool. So, you know, I'm contributing to the greater body of scientific knowledge. And, and anybody can do this. You don't have to have expertise. This is something that if you're a, a feeder watcher, know your chickadees and cardinals and, and robins, and that's all you know, you can still contribute. So it's a really cool tool. When I was doing my my uh, what I call my little big year, my Hancock County big year. You know, I saw lots of birds, saw chickadees, and I'll share one quick anecdote about chickadees and one or two anecdotes other than that, then we'll move on. But, um, so chickadees are, I think of the norm of, of the bird world. 
And so some of you know who Norm Peterson is. So think of that, the old 80s TV show, Cheers. And every time Norm walked in the bar and everybody said, Norm! And, and the chickadee's kind of that way. All the other birds at the feeder love the chickadee. And I can, in my own head, when the, when the chickadee comes in, what I'm hearing, the little, the little tweeting and twittering banter of the birds, what I'm really hearing is them saying, Norm, which is the, the bird equivalent of chickadee. You know, they, they love the chickadee. Chickadees are hypervigilant. They're sentinels. They're like looking around. Is there, is there a sharp shin hawk over there? Is there a barred owl over there? They're paying attention and they're feeding and they're pretty skittish, but they're, they're friendly too, especially the other smaller birds. And, and so there's this bird that all the other birds like. As a young bander, I remember being in college and we were doing mist netting, set up nets, and there's chickadees. And we need some, the instructor said, we need somebody to go get the, the birds out of the net. He showed us how to do it. And there's a chickadee. And he's like, who wants to do it? Nobody's raised their hand. I said, I'll do it. So I went and got the chickadee. I've got my chickadee in my hand. And the first thing that chickadee did is turn his head and take its little seed crunching bill and pinch a little bit of skin. Man, did that hurt. So, um, and then yeah, I'm trying to untangle it. I'm trying to mobilize the head. It's twisting and it's fighting. It's got its bill under my cuticles and under my fingernail bed. And, and it was painful. And I've banded so many hundreds of chickadees. And I have no physical scars in my hands, but I have emotional scars from banding chickadees. And I came to realize there was a form of ornithological hazing. The older you are as a bird bander, the more likely you are to let that somebody else younger, like me, band the chickadee. Now I'm, I'm one of these older banders. And when I'm working with younger with students, I'll say, go get that chickadee out. So I'm, I'm passing on the tradition of ornithological hazing. Um, I'm, so the chickadee was the first bird, the, the very first bird I saw in 2018 um, when I was doing the Scooty Christmas bird count. And and I did it with my friend Don and his adult son, um, Kyle Lima. And they're my regular, two of my regular, well, Don especially is my regular birding buddy. Don's 10 days younger than me and he jokes around about me being his elder. So um, I like to milk that I'm his elder. But anyway, we're birding and it was blowing a gale at Scooting Point. And we decided not to get out of Don's truck and we're looking out and gulls are flying by, whipping by in the wind. And one gull whipped by and, um, and it was this guy with all white wingtips. Our common seagull, the herring gull, has black wingtips. And so all three of us knew instantly what this was, glaucus gull, so we're really excited. So this is a bird that we used to see commonly on the coast of Maine back in the day when we had fish hatcheries, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, fish processing plants, canneries, all that offal went into the water, often untreated, and the gulls, the, these white winged gulls, the glaucus gull and the ivory gull in particular, loved it. And now when we, in 2010, when we closed that last Maine cannery in in korea um we lost we lost the food source for these winter gulls and so we see we do see glaucus gulls annually but not like we used to um it was a little bit later and let's see if i've got the date here um i don't but i it was still spring leaves were not out yet and saw a palm warbler and so palm warblers this was a bird that that um james bond the ornithologist not the secret agent and there's a whole other story about that, but I don't think I'll take time today to tell you that story, although it's catch me sometime, I'm happy to tell it. But James Bond, the ornithologist, was the first person in 1934 to document them nesting south, or to, des, to document them nesting in the continental US. And he found them nesting in, um, in the bog, that huge, uh, the huge bog, uh, Great Meadow down in, uh, not Great Meadow, um, the Great Heath over in Southwest Harbor area near Bass Harbor Marsh. So. That was really cool. Like we suspected they nested in the continental US, but he was the first one to find it nesting on the bog map. But we got some rarities too, like Chuck Will's Widow. This is a bird you expect to find in New Jersey and South. And, and when one was reported in uh, Great Pond Mountain Wildlands, and it was a time I was, um, I've, had, I've had a lot of great luck in my life or good, good you know, privilege to work with and travel all around the world. And, and some of you know the old radio show, uh, Prairie Home Companion, and Garrison Keillor, its host. And Garrison had been hiring my wife and me for years to work with him when he chartered a cruise ship and did this fundraising cruise for Minnesota Public Radio. So I was, the weeks uh, leading up to our, our June departure in 2018, and we were going to the, uh, I believe that was the Baltic that year. And we were, um, I was so flat out busy between tours and preparing lectures and finalizing lectures for that trip that when this bird was found in early June, I said, I can't go chase it. I don't have the time to drive the 40 minutes to Great Pond Mountain Wildlands and walk. You gotta go in the dark and walk the three miles in and look for it, I just don't have the time. Finally, it was the eve of our departure. And I told my wife, I said, 
I'm, I've got to go. It's now or never. And so I walked, I went and drove there, took my bike and biked in the dark. And it was just this amazing experience, just me and the crunch of my tires on the gravel road and my headla headlamp on my bike and the headlight on my head and biking in. And I'm hearing com the booming of common nighthawks. They've got this really cool sound they do when they're flying and they're diving and their wings make this fluttering noise and it's, they call it booming. And then I heard the, the call of the, the incessant call of the whippoorwill. And I haven't heard whippoorwills at MDI in 15 or 20 years, but they're, they were abundant over there. So you hear whippoorwill, 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 and just kept going. Everywhere where there was a little bit of open grassland, you'd hear whippoorwills. And I'm biking, I've got the GPS going for the coordinates where the Chuck Wills widow was last seen. And I'm approaching the coordinates and I'm listening, biking and listening to the crunch, the bike wheels that tie to the ground, you know, just, just me and, and, and the nature. I heard a hermit thrush and again, whippoorwills going, Whipper will, whipper will, Chuck Will's widow, Chuck Will's widow. <coughs> Excuse me. And suddenly, and I, I kept biking. I'm, I'm still hearing whipper will, but it had morphed into Chuck Will's widow. Like, oh my gosh, I just, that's it. So I stopped. And I've seen Chuck Will's widow in my life. I don't have to see the bird as long as I can positively identify it, which I did by sound. I'm good. I'm happy with that. So I got Chuck Will's widow. So I got off my bike. There's nobody out this night, you know, three miles in. I just laid down on the ground listening and had my headlamp shining straight up. And all of a sudden, I like, Oh, look at that straight up. There's this angels flying. Like it was this magical thing. The angels were Luna moths. There must have been 30 or 40 Luna moths flying in my headlamp, the glare of my headlamp up above. And Chuck Will's will, widow's calling, whippoorwill's calling, the nighthawks booming. It was one of the most magical nights I've had in my life. So that was pretty, pretty special. So this is one of the best birds of the year for me. Um, Dove Key is a, um, a cousin of the puffin. These guys nest in the high Arctic uh, from you know, high Arctic like Baffin Island in North America to Greenland to, you know, uh, northern um, Nova Scotia, uh, northern Norway and, and, you know, northern Arctic Russia. And, uh, but we see them on occasion here. This one, we, I was leading a bird tour, a winter bird tour. We saw it at Sand Beach. And of course, everybody was really excited. Uh, it was actually funny as we were pulling in, one of the people in my van said, Rich, can you, I want you to find us a dove key. I'm like, yeah, sure. And I'm just like joking like I was going to. We got walked down the steps of Sand Beach and there was a dove key. So, you know, it's, it was a great thing to see. A lot of the birds we see are birds you, you can only see offshore on a boat. The further offshore you get, the better your chance of seeing it. Birds like Northern Fulmar, which ne the nearest nesting that I know of is Bird Island. No, not Bird Island. Yeah, Bird Island off of the northern shore of Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. Um, so way, quite a ways north. Um, and there's just a couple that nest there. And then you get up into like northern Newfoundland, some nest there, and you get to uh, the northern part of the British Isles and then nest there. So they're a north, northern North Atlantic species. And then there's common birds that we kind of take for granted. We hear this little chittering in the woods, uh, but we don't always see these guys, the kinglet, which is the golden crown kinglet, which is smaller than, than our chickadee, but they're, um, they're actually really common. And this little tiny bird that's on everybody's food, uh, the bottom of the food web for everybody that eats birds. And so these guys are so skittish, but when you get a good look at one, it's just, it's just magical, this little tiny bird that somehow is able to harness enough fat to, to survive our cold winters. And not so cold here on the coast, but when you get interior Maine, it's really cold and these guys survive. And then my very last bird of the year on December 30th was a boreal chickadee. It's essentially a brown capped chickadee, but this is a bird of northern forest. And we used to have them here on MDI. And this is a bird that's really suffered, suffering and suffered the ravages of climate change. I remember the fall of 86, not long after I started my job on Whiteface Mountain, I was sent to Bar Harbor and stayed at the old Atlantic, Atlantic Oaks, which is now the Atlantic Oceanside, um, to, uh, for a, it was a conference, that, um, an, an acid rain workshop that was being held here. And so I got sent here. And, and then I stayed a few extra days. I went to Blackwoods and camped at Blackwoods. And I remember being in Blackwoods campsite, my campsite there, and like boiled chickens were all over my campsite. And it was so cool. And, and then I started coming about every other year to come to MDI. And every year I saw fewer and fewer boiled chickadees. And I think in the last 10 years, I've seen exactly one boiled chickadee on MDI. Their range is definitely shifting north. You do find them in where there's still some very mature, I won't even say old growth, but very mature boreal habitat on the coast. You might find them. Um, I get reports of them from Blue Hill area sometimes. On some of the down east outer islands, I'll find them. But to find them reliably, you have to go north kind of Katahdin area. And so the range is, the whole range is really shifting north. And that's, that's being tied to climate change. Um, climate's warmer than they like. The, 
the food web is starting to change. Um, and so, so boiled chicken is suffering those ravages. So all of that, you know, I, I did that year and I drove 6,390 miles. And I, I have always fashioned myself an environmentalist, but I, I never really thought about how much do I drive to go birding. And because I was doing this big year, I was keeping all kinds of notes and, and records beyond my usual. I like, how many hours did I spend birding? How many hours did I spend getting to the place to go birding? How many hours did I spend getting home from birding? How many, how many miles did I drive? And I had this all in a spreadsheet. And then I uh, tallied it up at the end of the year. And I drove 6,390 miles just to go birding in Hancock County. And I have to admit, I was pretty appalled by how much I drove and how much carbon that translates to. That's a lot of carbon. And so I said, someday I'm going to do this again. And I'm going to do it at zero carbon. And I didn't know when I was going to do it. I figured I'm going to do it someday when um, maybe when I turn 60. That'd be a great year to celebrate my 60th birthday. But the reality is my work doing nature tours, there's, you know, I travel probably cumulatively during the course of a normal non-pandemic year. I'm gone somewhere between two to three months of the year. And not all at once, but like, you know, a week here, three weeks or six weeks there. And it adds up often with my family, which is great. I love traveling with my family. But, um, um, but I said, I'm going to do this maybe for my 60th. But, when I, but to do that meant that it would it, to do the big year the way I want to do it would impede my, my traveling, which is part of my, my livelihood. So I remember in November, in November, if you think about this past November, we had no idea what this year was going to look like in terms of COVID. So my wife and I said, we're committing to no international travel, no travel probably outside of Maine. So this is the year for me to do my zero carbon year. I wish I could say that it meant I was parking my car for the year. But, you know, I live eight miles north of downtown Bar Harbor. My daughter just started ninth grade. She's got after school activities. Um, she's got friends. No, none of her friends live locally. So it means driving her to her friends' houses. Um, so, you know, going shopping, it's really hard to do a multi a week or two week or three week shop when you live in a place where there's no, no public transportation. So I said, okay, I'm only going to count the birds when I leave my house under my own power, whether carrying my, my canoe or kayak to Northeast Creek, which is just a quarter mile away or biking, a lot of biking or biking to the trailhead with my skis on the bike and then skiing the carriage roads. So, so that suddenly became this year. And that's, that's been my year. Um, I'm approaching 2,000 miles of biking this year, um, and um, and and so yeah, I, and I'm going to do another book, and the book will be written in the same my same voice. My my first book, Little Big Year, um, was written in my storytelling voice. I love telling stories, and my in my family, I'm the storyteller. So um, my daughter, since she was little, said, "Daddy, tell me a story." And she doesn't want made-up stories. She wants stories that are real. Um, and, and when I'm with uh, family, they like, so Rich, what's, what's a good story? What do you have for us? So I'm a storyteller. My book was written in my first person narrative storytelling voice. The next book, which I'm still figuring, I'm kind of searching for the name for it. Zero carbon, little big year seems like a lot of, a lot of words, but, um, but it'll be my storytelling voice, but it's going to be weaving in a lot of science of climate change and environmental science and, and you know, kind of changing populations of birds. So it's, it's going to be heavy on science, but I'm going to tell it like I was talking to a non-science audience. Um, and then I'll have you know, lots of primary sources cited at the end. That's my plan. I've been working on that. It'll come out sometime next year. So that's, great. that's, yeah, so that's kind of my presentation. That's great. Can I um, jump in with a couple of questions for yeah, you? Yeah, and I'm going to stop sharing here and go back to, to our so screen. You, you, know, you mentioned climate change and, and certainly the idea of you know, zero carbon birding is really interesting to me in some ways that almost sounds more enjoyable, right? You have the opportunity to use your bike or kayak or what ha hike, what have you. Um, that's fantastic. But so back to kind of the, the effects that you may be seeing um, on the, the local, you know, birding population, you mentioned the cardinals now are quite popular, whereas perhaps before, and that may or may not be due to climate change, but you also mentioned the boreal chickadee. Are there other species that you definitely either don't see or see more now and you that you can kind of connect to a change in climate? Yeah, there's, there's so many species. Um, the very short of it is that three quarters of all species globally are in some state of decline. Mm -hmm. um, 
and some of that decline is fairly fairly low. Like black clap chickadees actually showing a, a slight dec decline, but we're still seeing them, and a lot of them, and we will for a long time. Um, and, and the black capped chickadee, it looks like their range might be shifting north. This, this is kind of new evidence. Um, actually, there is, if sometime you're interested in, the, in this kind of thing, if you go online to Cornell Lab, of, or if you just do a Google search for bird cast, one word, and mm -hmm. it's a site maintained by Cornell Lab of Ornithology, mm -hmm. and they have interactive maps and they have live maps about changing bird populations and even migration, you know, uh, instantaneous, like what's migration forecast for tonight? What was it last night? So he's got these wonderful um, maps of North America showing migration. So the data, the power of data is so big now that we're really learning so much more. We're seeing, we are seeing uh, black capped chickadee populations shifting a little bit north. Um, birds like the red knot is declining by over 90% in the last 50 years. And that's not tied to climate change, that's tied to loss of migration foraging, of, of migration forage. They eat horseshoe crab eggs in, in the Chesapeake Bay, and horseshoe crabs have been grossly overharvested for lots of reasons, including medical research. Mm -hmm. um, but so the, the, the red knots have lost the vast majority of their, their critical uh, fats, fattening food reserves to get them to South America. So there's just not enough food, so they're not making it. Um, and so their population is down 90%. Huh. So that's a, that's a human well, I hope cause. Nobody gets COVID. Pardon me? I think somebody just had their mic on by accident. Oh, yeah. Um, so there's that. But there's some species, um, certainly a lot of the warblers, and you can almost pick any warbler species. Most warblers, not all, but most are declining. Most of them are shifting north as well. And we're seeing some asynchrony. And this is like the warblers are starting, we're starting to, see, we're kind of in the beginning of seeing some struggle. So think of the warblers wherever you live that arrive to breed in your area. So here on MDI, let's pick a couple black throated green warbler black and white warbler, and historically black pole warbler. Um, and they may or may not be breeding here now, and they might next year, they might not, but you know, it varies. So there's three I've just picked. The, um, the black and white warblers seem to be pretty adaptive, and their population seems pretty stable. Black-throated green warblers show a very minor decline. Black pole warblers show a more sub substantive decline. But one thing we're seeing is that all of these species, when they arrive, the, the phenology of bud break and the phenology of insect emergence is shifting. The birds, their cues, when they're down in somewhere warm, they're in Florida, they're in Central America or South America, their cues from when it's time to come north, they don't know if there's still snow here or not. They don't know if bud break has happened or not. So they're going on solar cues. The daylight's just right, now it's time to go north. And this is something that like it evolved over, over countless eons of time. The birds evolved to know when do you migrate north, when do you not. The ones that migrated too early, didn't get food. The ones that migrated too late didn't get enough food. So there is a sweet spot of the ones that have migrated at the right time. They had the highest vigor and they produced the most young who then got the genetic coding. This is the time to migrate north. Um, Interesting. So, so we're seeing, and, and any gardeners out there know that we're seeing flowers emerge earlier, which means insects are emerging earlier. And I think even in the 20 years I've been here, I think spring is coming on average somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 days earlier. Um, that's a lot when you're a migratory bird. It's the, the plants have a little bit more ability to adapt to that in the short term. In the long term, it, depend, it will start deciding on um, things like what's the climate zone for the plants and is that plant able to adapt to that climate zone. You know, I could, I could envision a future, I don't know how far in the future, but I could envision a future. We don't have many conifers on MDI. Certainly when Samuel de Champlain was sailing by here in 1604, this island was almost covered in, in, in uh, conifers and spruce and hemlock and fir and, and pines. And, you know, and we certainly don't see as much of that today. We still see a lot, but someday in the future, in the future beyond our, all of our lives, but maybe in my daughter's life, I don't know, but we'll, there'll be a future where there's a lot less conifers in this island, maybe, maybe none. So, so birds, you know, that, that time is shifting and the birds, there's still the occasional bird that their genetic coding gets out of whack and they'll come too early. But if they come 10 days early, like, wow, the f insects are here. This is perfect. <laughs> um, and then they, they suddenly get the message to shift. But that's like, that's the outlier. So we need the outliers to become the mainstream. Um, and, and so those birds that come always at the same time, and actually like great blue heron is a great example. I feel like April 1st every year is when I, go, I know to go look for great blue heron. I always find it 
give or take two days, I find great blue heron. Um, and great blue heron, um, it's not the best example, but if, if they were, um, but let's say, let's say May 1st is the day that, that the um, black pole warbler arrives. No, they're not, uh, the, the black throated green warbler arrives. Let's just pick that as their date. It's a little bit early, but so if May 1st is their day and they get here, but, the, but springs come a little bit earlier and they're like, you know, they find food then, but those insects go through their life cycle. And by the end of the insect life cycle, the, 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 um, the warbler's young are hatching and need food, but suddenly their insect base is kind of dwindling. And mm. so they have to figure out, can they eat other insects? So, so this, that's part of that synchrony of the timing. So the birds, when, when they're, they're out of sync timing wise with the phenology of their forage base, that's, yeah. that's where the, the global climate change is really hitting the birds. Interesting. One of the questions in the chat um, is talking about insects. It says, do you have any insight on why we've had remarkably fewer insects this year? Just curious um, if you noted that. Yeah, I, I don't have huge insights, but I have some thoughts on that and some things I've read. And think about, you know, um, I, I don't know the eight mean age of our group, but I'm going to go on a limb and say, you know, we're probably all in our 50s and older, maybe late 40s and older. And so think back to when you were younger, a younger adult. And driving for me, it was like back in right out of college. It's the '80s, and I bought my first beat up old pickup truck. And I'm driving up Whiteface Mountain to go to work. And I'm driving from my home in Lake Placid on on a spring day, and my bug my windshield got splattered with bugs. Our windshields don't get splattered with bugs anymore, and that's something called the windscreen effect. And there was a German scientist that actually made this you know observation and started doing some studies on it, including wind tunnel effects. You know, we know that our cars are more aerodynamic to to make them more fuel efficient, but does that affect the bug splatter? And and there was at least one paper. I don't know if it's. I can't. I can only think of one paper. But there was at least one paper that said the bugs don't seem to reduce their splatter on more aerodynamic cars. There, there's enough mass that they still fly forward and hit our windshield. So we're seeing less bug splatter on our cars. If that one paper is true, um, um, or if it's reproducible, so we got, you know we've got less bugs causing less bug splatter. And we certainly know from lots of other studies, there are less bugs out there. Um, and, and, you know, in North America, I've read a number once, and the number that sticks in my head was 94%. We have a 94% in wetlands in North America, uh, in, uh, in, the United, in the continental United States, because of filling in for farming, for development, for whatever. Um, you know, I think about when Walmart was built in Bangor, and they wanted to fill in that wetland up there, and they had to come up with some mitigation wetland. And, you know, the wetland was partially saved and partially not. The wet, and, in Ellsworth, they did fill in a wetland to build a Walmart, and that wetland that's across the street from them uh, is a mitigation wetland. And mitigation wetlands never are as, as, as productive as a natural wetland. The natural wetland formed there because that was met all the right conditions for a wetland. Our mitigation wetlands don't meet all the right conditions for wetland. Right. And so they're a poor human attempt at making a wetland. Right. So we are we're changing the landscape to make it less favorable for insects. And then things like I just read uh, heard on NPR. Uh, about a month or so ago, what I took as a really disturbing report, it was not meant to be disturbing, but I took it as disturbing. A German scientist was coming up with a technique to take this one species of mosquitoes and make them all, uh, I forget what, what it was now, I, I need to find the paper that they cited, but it was basically to take them all so that when they reproduce, they're going to reproduce and, and make sterile offspring, and then eventually they would have no more of that species, which would then get rid of malaria in malaria uh, parts of the world. And, and it, was, it was a human health problem they were trying to solve. It's a noble cause. But I'm thinking, you're just wiping out a part of the food chain. We're going to see consequences that we have no, we can't anticipate. We're going to see birds disappear and go extinct. And I, I'm, not, I'm all in favor of getting rid of malaria, but not at the cost of, of making species go extinct, which I think is a real threat that they did not consider. So right. anyway, so that's basically it's our, our, our alteration of landscapes that yeah. are causing insect decline significantly. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, we have another question here. It says, you spoke about a bird feeder corridor for cardinals, and we have seen them more regularly now in New York City and on MDI. Can I take it that you are supportive of bird feeders? Are there any limits or protocols you suggest for use of bird feeders? That is a great question. Bird feeders, there's a fairly limited body of research on bird feeding and whether it's harmful or not to birds. I know like the, the mantra that everybody that I hear often is either they're just adamant bird feeding is bad, um, but there's actually very little evidence to support that. Uh, there's also very little evidence to say is good. Um, so 
So I don't know that we can use science to support or deny bird feeding. But you know, the other thing I've heard is that, um, well, you need to take your bird feeders in the summer. And what we do know from bird feeding studies is that most birds that come to your bird feeder, the bird feeder is one stop of many stops on a very large feeding circuit. Uh, chickadees are a great study subject because they're really uh, adaptable to humans. And so when you see those chickadees at your feeder and you see them all day, the chickadee you saw in the morning is definitely not the chickadee. It, the chickadee at eight o'clock in the morning is not the chickadee you saw at nine. It's not the chickadee you saw at 10 or three in the afternoon or four or sunset. Um, and I actually, I did a study. I was curious one day, I said, I'm gonna ban chickadees in my feeder. How many chickadees do I get in my feeder in one day? And in one day, you know, you look at your feeder at any given time, you see, I'm gonna go high, 10 chickadees, that's really high. And so, but I banded 86 chickadees in one day at my feeder. And the next day I banded like 68 chickadees. The next day it was like, you know, 80 something. And so, and I didn't get a lot of repeat banding. So like, we know from studies that have been done that they're coming to your feeder, they're going to somebody else's feeder, they're going to, uh, you know, to a patch where maybe there's some alder that are fruiting. They're going to a patch where there's you know, some, maybe some hemlock that, that's having a, a, an insect outbreak. They're going to these feeding circuits and the circuits can be quite big and they might not come back to your feeder for a day or two um, or at least many, many hours. But so if you have your feeder, they like great food. If your feeder is empty, they're like, okay, no food, I go to the next stop. So, so in the case of chickadees and using chickadee as the model, then feeding is not critical to them. Um, so I think that, you know, I've had this conversation with many people and where I've come out in this is, if you wanna feed, feed. If you wanna feed in the summer, feed in the summer. If you don't, don't. If you live somewhere in bear country, take your feeders in, when, in the spring when the bears start coming out. Um, if, you, if you do wanna feed, but you're going away for two weeks, it's not really that critical to feed your birds while you're away. If you come back and you start feeding, the birds aren't coming to your feeder, oops. Sorry, my alarm going off there. Um, if, you're, if you're coming back, the birds aren't coming, just be patient, they'll come back. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's really, it's, it comes down to personal choice, but my, my advocacy for feeding is, I think it, it generates a uh, kind of a, an interest in birds and an interest develops into a love of birds. And then a love says, what can I do to help the birds? Maybe start doing some native plant uh, landscape in your yard. And then suddenly you join your local land trust. And so it develops this, conservation ethic that in the end benefits the birds. So I think bird feeding is one of many strategies for, for helping birds in the, in the big picture. That's great. So talking about, you know, kind of that developing that conservation ethos, um, you mentioned early on in your, in your opening remarks about the importance of exposing young people, you know, to these kinds of things and birding and all that. And, and just thinking about, you know, living here and, and maybe a lot of retirees, maybe have more time for taking on activities like this. So if you're new to this idea of sort of field biology or birding, what would you recommend? How do you recommend people get started? Are there certain resources that you, you know, point people to, to begin this hobby or, or hopefully sure. passion? <laughs> There's so many ways to get involved. And, um, you know, if you live wherever you live in, in the United States anyway, pretty much every state has an Audubon chapter. I'm gonna go on the limb and say every state. And certainly it's in states in the Northeast that where I know them better, you know, all the New England states and New York all have regional chapters as well. So, so I would say you know, a great way to, to, is to join your state or local Audubon chapter. And here in an, uh, Hancock County, our ch local chapter is Down East Audubon. And they do, if you're a member of Down East Audubon, they do field trips uh, pretty much monthly that are free to members. Joining your local Audubon, it's fairly cheap. It's you know, like in Maine, if you join Maine Audubon, it's, I think it's $50 to join as a family membership, give or take a little bit. And then that automatically makes you a member of Down East Audubon. Down East Audubon, now you can go on their field trips for free. You can go to their, their monthly lectures or their monthly Zoom meetings, depending on what, where we are in the pandemic. And, and that's a great way. And they, their leaders vary from you know, people that are like, I lead tri trips for them to somebody who's like, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I was a beginning birder and now I'm leading trips for Audubon, like somebody like that. Um, so there's this wide range, but it's a great way to, to meet the local birding community. If you go on an Audubon trip, they have loaner binoculars. You don't have to have your own binoculars. Mm. Um, somebody like me, like in the winter, I do these weekly birding tours. And if you're interested, you know, seek me out. My, my business is thenaturalhistorycenter.com. And you can email me from there and, and you say you want to get my mailing list. And so I email and I, you know, they're like, it's like $20 a person in the winter. 
and we go out and we look for birds and it's, you know, we often see the same birds, but there's this camaraderie. Um, and I, I treat them often as kind of an introductory birding thing. I have, I have loaner binoculars. And <laughs> so that's a great way to start. Um, if you, you know, if you do have binoculars or if you don't, you think about, you want to get binoculars, it's probably the most expensive purchase that I, that you might make. And, and I always tell people, I hate to say this, but you can't get binoculars that are worth very much for much less than a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, the more you spend, the better you get. If you're willing to spend 150 or 200 dollars, you can get some pretty decent binoculars. But for much less than 100 bucks, it's not going to be worth a whole lot. I hate to say it because there are a lot of binoculars that are like, you know, somebody told me, I found these binoculars and they're 30 dollars. These I showed them a pair. Said, these are 150. Look at them. Like, oh my God, they're so much better than my 30 dollars. They couldn't even use theirs anymore. But um, so I, yeah, I don't want to spoil you because you know it's, it's the old story. You get what you pay for. 30 dollar right. binoculars. If you're going to buy them, you might be happier just giving me the $30 and coming on a bird tour. Um, right. <laughs> but, but getting involved in Audubon is a great way to go. And, um, and things like, you know, here in MDI, there's also Soames Maynell Wildlife Sanctuary mm-hmm. and Billy Halpern does bird walks. So find your local, your local land trust, your local nature preserve, and chances are they're doing something. That's a great way. Start with somebody that knows something about birds. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So we've got, we're closing in on our hour, but we just have one question here. I want to ask you, how often do you need to clean your bird feeders? Um, I, I'm, I am not, um, I'm, I don't do this, but I should do this. In an ideal world, in the absolute ideal world, you clean your feeders every time you fill them. In a, mm. in a compromised world, you would f- clean them once a week. Um, and the cleaning them is, depending on your feeder, it's basically take a 10% ammonia solution or 10% bleach solution so, you know, 10 parts water, one part bleach or ammonia, and you can soak it in a bucket of that. You can, you can take, I've got a you know, bottle brush, scrub my, my uh, feed seeders, uh, feed feeders out, seed feeders out. Uh, my hummingbird feeders come entirely apart. I've got a little small fine brush. I can get it into every little crevice. Um, ideally, at least once a week during the season when you're using them. Um, and then if you're not game to that, you know, then you know, maybe can you do it monthly? But mm-hmm. the longer you go without cleaning, the more risk that birds that have some disease will show up. And, um, and the disease often get, disease, bird diseases often get transmitted at feeders where there's a concentration of birds. Mm-hmm. So cleaning your feeders really helps. Interesting. All right. Rich, this has been fascinating. I can't believe an hour has gone by so quickly, but thank you so much for spending this time with us. And I'm sure people will reach out to you with additional questions and, and check out your, you know, your website. We look forward to, if we haven't already, reading a little big year, but also we look forward to your next project. So thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you, Jerry. It was really an honor to get to speak for you guys. All right. Take care and happy birding. Thank you. Same to everybody here.